Thank you so much, Judy, for being with me. And I have a few questions I want to ask you. First of all, what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? I think it all boils down to learning to care for what you love. As a child, I spent a lot of time in nature. I grew up in a small town on the edge of, of a woods. And uh, my parents were great campers and hikers and canoeists and so on. And so I developed a real love of the environment. And my mother was a Girl Scout leader. And I grew up in a household that believed in in service. And so from a young age, I thought of myself as someone that would be a caretaker of nature and also of animals. I'm a great animal lover. And that started when I was very young. I realized that animals are really uh, dependent, you know, domestic animals are very dependent on human beings uh, to care for them and just caring for my dog. So I think caring, uh, you know, caring for others um, and, and Girl Scouts also, we uh, learn to care, you know, have community service projects. I had the, the experience of local business ownership. One of my friend's father owned the local drugstore. Another friend's father owned the local filling station. All the small businesses that made up our small town were very important to me. And as I grew to be a teenager and the first mall was built, you know, back in the 60s, one of the first McDonald's also was in our, our area. So I saw, uh, you know, the um, the beginning of, of corporate control of our economy and how the hardware store in my small town, which was a beautiful old fashioned hardware store with these uh, long uh, wooden uh, steps in the front where the, the men used to sit on the steps drinking coffee in the morning. That went under to, you know, the corporate chains. Uh, same with the drugstore. I saw the, the demise, you know, of a small business at the hands of uh, corporate chains. And so that was something that was very uh, powerful for me. When I moved to the city, the block that I was living on and working on was uh, slated for demolition. So I can remember when the trucks were coming up the back alley and started to demolish the half of the block, you know, behind me, they can uh, demmed uh, the whole block of uh, small businesses with apartments and uh, homes above to make way for a mall. I ended up lying down in front of the bulldozer <laughs> to stop it from bulldozing the house behind me. My first protest was stopping a bulldozer from tearing down a small business to make way for a mall. It was always long a cause of mine to protect a community. And same with the environment and animals too. I mean, it's animals are so abused by uh, corporations and uh, pharmaceuticals uh, testing, uh, you know, monkeys and uh, beagles. My my dog was a beagle dog. Beagles are used for testing. I found that out when I was only 10. I got an invitation to contribute to the anti-vivisection league that was opposing experimentation on animals. And there was a photograph of a beagle being strapped down on an operating table. Uh, and this, I was so appalled by this. And so that became my first cause to to work against the experimenting on animals. There are many, many things really, causes that I've taken up in my life. And I think it really stems from, from wanting to protect, you know, what we love and care about. Uh, that's the number one thing for me. And then uh, the Vietnam War, that was a huge influence on me because the, the grown-ups were all in favor of the war. Like we were fighting communism. You know, our generation conflicted with our parents because we, we didn't want to go and fight for something we didn't believe in. You know, I had friends that were maimed or killed in the war. And then afterwards, or even during the war, I started to realize that we were being lied to, that we weren't really fighting uh, to save democracy. In fact, we, it was just the opposite. We were on the wrong side. We were keeping democracy from coming to Vietnam. I, I gained as a young person a distrust for the government and for authority. I mean, don't get me wrong. I feel that the government is really important too. Uh, when it is truly by the people, the most important way we have of uh, standing up to the power of corporations it can be misguided. We have to stay vigilant as citizens. We can't just always believe everything we're told. As it was the case in the Vietnam War, we were fighting to control our sources, you know, for finding cheap labor and finding cheap resources in underdeveloped countries. To have a democracy, we must always be seeking the truth. We must question authority, especially when lives are at stake. That was an important part of, of my life. Those are the main points that really influenced me. I, I never did lay down in front of a bulldozer, but I did watch some very special places be bulldozed in my hometown to put up a mall. And I have to ask you, I'm assuming the bulldozer stopped and what happened at, at that point? When I lay down in front of the bulldozer, he did stop. <laughs> my colleague ca called our lawyer and we were able to get a restraining order to keep them from demolishing the buildings which lasted, I don't know, for months. 
But then eventually the other side did win and they did destroy half of our block. But we, we did, through our actions, saved our half of the block. I lived there for 40 years, you know, on yeah. that block that I saved and started a business there, the White Dog Cafe, which I ran for 30 years. I was able to save the half of the block where I then lived for, for 40 years. Yeah, and I do think that that anger uh, can be uh, healthy, or uh, but that wasn't my driving force. But I, I think that if you care deeply and love deeply, you're going to be outraged or angry when someone attacks what you love. That's not a bad thing. But I um, acting from a place of love rather than acting from a place of anger gets the best results. <laughs> what continues to motivate you to be an activist? It guides you. What gives you courage? Right now, I guess the biggest thing for me is climate change. And how do we uh, first slow down climate change? And secondly, how do we prepare for it? Because it's it's here now and we have to survive climate change and help the younger generations to prepare for climate change and prepare our communities to survive climate change. To me, the most important thing we can do that both uh, reduces carbons and, and prepares us for what's coming is to build self-reliant local economies where we produce our basic needs of, of food, clothing, energy, building materials as close to home as possible. Uh, my organization that I recently started three years ago is called All Together Now Pennsylvania. It's an effort to uh, unite rural and urban communities to build local supply chains for our basic need. Uh, there's a lot of politics involved with this. I mean, for instance, through our work with plant medicine, we became involved with cannabis, the legalization of cannabis as a, a plant medicine. In Pennsylvania, medical marijuana has been legalized, uh, but adult use has not yet been. And uh, when medical marijuana was legalized, the entire industry is owned by large outside corporations which of course is what I've been fighting against in all areas of the economy. But in this particular area of the economy of cannabis, unlike any other area of the economy, uh, the government, the local government, the state government has the opportunity, in fact, the responsibility first to legalize and then to regulate the legalization of cannabis. And the way they did it with medical marijuana allowed large outside corporations to own everything. So instead of benefiting our young entrepreneurs and our farmers and so on, it's only benefiting large outside corporations that are headquartered in Chicago or Miami or whatever. So now that adult use marijuana is being about to be debated, we want to make sure that the benefitization go to our small farmers and especially to entrepreneurs from communities of color that have been so devastated by the war on drugs. And the war on drugs was really created by Nixon to punish two groups of people that were his enemies, hippies that were protesting the war and black people. So I'm very uh, passionate about uh, how can we as activists succeed in legislation in our state of Pennsylvania that legalizes marijuana in a way that gives that economic opportunity, which is estimated to be two to three billion dollars a year in sales, make sure that those who benefit are those who were damaged by the war on drugs, as well as our small struggling farmers. So I'm working to empower local communities to produce their, their basic needs locally. And when we produce goods locally, not only are we creating wealth for our own communities and becoming more resilient, but we are also reducing the carbons of long distance shipping. And we're reducing our dependency on global supply chains, which are already breaking down because of the pandemic, because of the weather, because of terrorism, because of war. It's hard to know which thing to focus on the most. People say we have to choose between protecting the environment or fighting for economic justice. When people are harmed by climate change, the people who are harmed the most are low-income people, people that live and work near the water. I know globally, these are the people that are hurt first. So it is an economic justice issue, uh, climate change. And it's very discouraging to me that more people aren't taking action about climate change. I mean, I don't fly now, except I, I need to visit my son who lives all the way in California. So I save my output of carbons to, to fly to visit my son. But I don't go on vacations anymore where I fly to some distant place because I don't deserve to, to have those carbons, uh, that carbon footprint. I You know, I've traveled in my life. If anyone's going to travel, I feel like it should be young people. And the older people need to be staying at home and helping the younger generation prepare for climate change, not 
creating more carbons. Climate change, I guess, is my main issue, but economic justice has always been an issue for me. And I sort of combine those two. How can we uh, include people in the supply chains in these industries, these local industries that have been excluded in the past? So communities of color in particular, um, how can we provide ownership opportunities. Do you have any connections with local schools? I was a regular speaker um, in a course at, at Temple for a while. If a school has an event or whatever where there's a, a large audience, you know, I always accept that. I do feel that there should be more intergenerational opportunity. You know, I feel that intergenerational work is the only way we're going to have the lasting change. My work as, a, as someone in my 70s with people that are in their 20s, 30s, or in 40s, is so important uh, to really carry change forward. It's not happening as much as I would like to see it, but where you see it successful, it's almost always because older people and younger people are working together. What advice do you have for youth activists? One thing is I think that all of us uh, should be engaged with building resilient local economies. Think about where does my food come from? Where does my energy come from? Where do my clothes come from? Where does my waste go? To really understand what the systems are where you are and to work to localize those, you know, going to farmers markets, supporting local farmers, buying used clothing. The young people are really great at making it popular to wear used clothing. The thrift stores are uh, just as good, if not better. You know, clothing and textiles are one of the greatest uh, polluters on uh, next to oil the fashion industry is the greatest environmental polluter young people should really think about how they're spending their money because a dollar is a vote if you spend your dollars at mcdonald's and you're you're voting for you know the abuse of animals um because the meat does not come it comes from a factory system i feel like we need to think about what are we supporting what are the values we're supporting what you know how are the workers treated how are the animals treated how is the environment treated by the company that we're supporting with our dollars but in general i think the whole idea is you know to really protect what you love i mean that's my driving force if you love nature and, uh, and animals or small business or whatever and i also as i mentioned before i think it is important important to, to work intergenerationally. I encourage young people to, to reach out to elders. Uh, we, we have a, a little project that I call the, the Circle of Aunts and Uncles, and it, it's mostly people of my generation, retirees that have put money into a pot, and then we make loans to young entrepreneurs from that fund, and we also provide uh, advice and guidance to them. So I feel that it is important to find ways to work uh, with older people when you're when you're young. We need to have uh, the power of intergenerational work to confront these challenges. Thank <laughs> you so much, Judy, for talking with me today. I really appreciate it.